Hi, and welcome to the Shame Plays Out of the Abyss Notes series, where I give my notes and thoughts and tips, uh, et cetera, uh, as I DM my group of intrepid heroes through Out of the Abyss, the D&D 5e Underdark Adventure at my friendly local game store. Remember to support your friendly local game store. Uh, you know, Amazon's great and all that. I got no problem with Amazon, but, you know, the, your friendly local game store provides community that uh, Amazon can't. So I just, you know, I like to throw that reminder out every now and then. Um, and free RPG days coming up, I think, in June. So make sure and see if your local uh, game store is free free RPG day. Those those are a lot of fun. So uh, for, for new viewers, I just want to make sure I like to, you know, point out that this is not an actual play. This is not a blow-by-blow blow of everything that happened in the previous session. What this is is just my thoughts, insight, tips, notes on not only running this adventure, uh, but sort of role-playing and DMing and, and all that in general. So, uh, and if you're a returning viewer, you know, thanks so much. So, uh, well, this is video 73. That blows my mind that we're 73 videos in. Uh, but we are, I'd say we're at least three quarters of the way through with Out of the Abyss as the campaign. Um, you know, so... I, wow, I, you know, it's been a while, been a lot of fun, um, and I, I can't believe we're 73 videos in on this. But anyway, having said all that, I'm going to put on my plus three spectacles of viewer feedback, and let's see what we can see on the viewer feedback. Now, um, as with recent videos, uh, the viewer feedback has been somewhat light, uh, so uh, I hope maybe that means that you know, I'm explaining everything so well, there's no questions or, or what. But anyway, always feel free to send in your uh, viewer comments on the videos. I, I, I read them all and try to respond to them all. And most of them I'll, I'll also include in the uh, viewer feedback portion of these videos. So Cody Lloyd, who is a uh, longtime viewer and a, who I've actually met in person uh, here in the lovely state of Arkansas. He said, hey, surprise to be the first one to comment. I don't have any questions. Great video. Cool, man. Cody, thanks. I'll always take that kind of encouragement. Um, and then we had a um, couple of comments from uh, Vasily Odin Crisson. Uh, let's see, or Crisson. I know I've got, I finally got the first name right. Uh, it's um, like Millie Vanilli, it's Vasily. I know that, right? So, and I'm assuming Odin's right. So now, now. Uh, I have to work on, is it Crisson or Crisson? So now that's the next part we have to work on. Uh, but he said, I agree that characters that fly without concentration can be very powerful in many situations. Uh, my group has a paladin that found a flying carpet. He used to be really bad against ranged attackers and flying creatures. Used to be. Now he just smashes everything in his way. And, and I made kind of a joke come. I said it can fly out of hand quickly. Yeah, flying characters... Um, you know, I have a monk that kept looking for uh, boots of flying, or maybe sandals of flying. I think it's boots of flying. Uh, and he kept looking um, and finally found them, uh, you know, because I have a, a, a way of doing, like if you're shopping at merchants, uh, you know, which I've discussed before. And, and he finally found them. You know, he didn't find them as regular loot, but he finally found them through a merchant, paid, you know, the a fair price by the book uh and so now he's got those flying sandals and so now he's a monk that already has all kinds of movement now he can fly uh and he's got the sun blade so he's basically a flying jedi you know with a lightsaber um you know so i think what that does as dms is it you know pushes us to find ways to challenge the players without cheating because you know, like most games, especially D&D, which is so, uh, like one of the reasons, you know, that it takes a while for a new edition to come out and they have all the play testers and this and that, is there is game balance. And games of game balance are like rock, paper, scissors. You know, for every for every rock, there's a scissor, right? Or, uh, or for every scissor, there's a rock, right? And for every rock, there's a paper. Uh, so there's a way to counter that without cheating. Um, and, and so I, I think it's just now with, with a, you know, pre done campaign, you have to, you know, you have to homebrew it a little bit or maybe, uh, really study, 
the the opponents and 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 use their tactics to the fullest. If you're home brewing, you know you can just make sure to include opponents or situations that uh, will not necessarily punish them for flying or whatever the ability is, uh, but will you know still challenge them uh, because no player in the game. Uh, you know, should be so powerful, they're unstoppable. You know, you hear people going, I, players are like, I, I can beat the DM. It's like, well, no, you, you, no, you can't. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's really kind of unfair because, because the DM can do whatever they want. So if, 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 if as a player, they're thinking there's, I'm unstoppable and I'm invulnerable and, and all that, it, it just doesn't work that way. So, but at the same time, you don't want to cheat. You don't want to, you don't want to punish them for being smart with how they play their character or finding something that works. So you just want to, you know, um, find, find things that, uh, that, you know, maybe have confined spaces, uh, that are hard to fly around in or, you know, the good old, uh, anti-magic field or, um, you know, uh, whatever there's, there's ways to, to get around it. Um, you know, or have, uh, multiple flying opponents, doesn't matter if you can fly, if you have a whole lot of opponents that are flying, you know, uh, you know, it kind of, it kind of nullifies that, that advantage. So anyway, uh, but yeah, that's, you know, it's true. If you don't have to concentrate, if you have a magic item that lets you fly and it doesn't require concentration, yeah, it can be, it can be pretty crazy. But again, just, you know, uh, use your creativity as a DM to find ways to, uh, to challenge that player, you know unless they're just really obnoxious and uh, really abusing it and it's just no fun for anybody. It's no fun for the DM. It's no fun for the other players. It just becomes, you know, that player and their amazing friends kind of thing. Then, yeah, just, I mean, outright, you know, get rid of that carpet or get rid of those flying sandals some way that, that makes sense inside the narrative of the game. So, okay, and then uh, Vasily also said, side note, I didn't get notified by YouTube when you posted the video. Not sure what's up. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I my own YouTube notifications have gotten a lot more unreliable over the past uh, few months. Uh, so I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't know how to fix that. I don't know if it's a problem with YouTube um, I, or, you know, or, or just email in general. Like I have Gmail. And YouTube, and they're both owned by the same company. So you think that YouTube emails would make it to uh, Gmail, you know, email servers? So I don't know. Uh, you know what I what I uh, recommended to um, Vasily, and in, in which he did. I've got you know my Twitter at Shane Plays. It's S H A N E P L A Y S. And I also have a Shane Shane Plays Facebook page, uh, and that's at facebookcom slash plays. You know, if you, if you really, if you're, if you're having trouble, uh, getting notifications of when content's posted, you know, you can follow those and, and, and now you'll see other stuff besides just my D and D videos or whatever, but you'll, you know, hopefully definitely at least see when that stuff goes out. Cause I always push out notifications on my social media when I put new, uh, content up. So anyway, uh, you know, Vasily, thanks for pointing that out. Um, you know, I, I, I just assumed it was me having problems, so I'm not, I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, but anyway, uh, if anybody else is having problems, like suddenly they're not getting notifications when new content is uh, published to YouTube, or especially if you're like, you get everybody else's notifications when they have new content, but you don't get when, when Shane plays stuff posts, you know, let me know. I'll try to find out what's going on, but you know, YouTube is so big, you know, and they're, they're probably they're you know, who knows if they'll even pay attention if I send a support thing on that. So anyway, so that's it for uh, viewer feedback and we'll get into the, uh, the main portion of, of, of the video and, and, uh, I will remove the plus three spectacles of viewer feedback. Now, um, couple of kind of rules. I like to go over kind of rules clarifications that came up during a session uh, before I get into kind of, re, you know, recapping and, and giving sort of a, an overview of the session. A uh, couple of things that, um, that came up. One, and this is one thing I should already know, but in my head, for some reason, I've got it that for, for every 24-hour period, basically, 
uh, you could do one short rest and one long rest. I just, that's my head cannon and that's wrong. You know, it came up uh, last session, uh, you know, somebody said, can we take another short rest? And I'm like, no, I don't think so. And, and, but I was wrong, you know, a player went, no, here's the rules. And I was like, correct. So uh, you can take multiple short rests per uh, 24 hours. But you can only take one long rest per 24 hours, which really makes sense if you think about it because you you can spend hit dice to get hit points back during short rest and you don't have to spend all of them. So, you know, if you can kind of ration your hit dice out uh, over short rest, then uh, that makes sense, right? That you can take multiple uh, short rests per um, 24 hour period. I don't even know if it says 24 hour period, you know, whatever that basically 24 hour period is. Um, I know you can't take more than one long rest within a standard, you know, day or, or, or whatever. Uh, now I agree with some people that, you know, the amount of like maybe ability resets or hit points you get back or some classes, you know, will get spells back or whatever. Short rest are really powerful. Um, you know, I mean, especially back in the day, you know, I mean, it took you forever to just naturally get a hit point back. You know, like you could get magical healing and things, but if you wanted to, like, just rest and like, you know, be in a hospital or, or I don't know, I don't know if you call it a hospital, you know, like a temple or something. Uh, and uh, I, I got off track thinking about what would what would it be a hospital? What would it be? Some sort of healing place or like you just get a room in it in and just lay there for days on end trying to get your hit points back. If I remember, I used to, like, back in the day, you got, like, one hit point a night. Um, and now, like, you know, you get all your hit points back on a long rest. And in a short rest, you get hit points back. So it's changed quite a bit. And you get spells back and this, that, and the other. Uh, you know, and, and, and I've heard people say, hey, it's a little bit too powerful for the short rest. You know, I, personally, I kind of agree. But, you know, D&D &D 5e is kind of built around... I guess that way of doing it. So I don't, I don't dislike it enough to change it. Uh, but I have a, heard other people propose other ways of doing it. And you can also think of uh, hit points. Uh, you know, they've been, they've been talking like this in D and D and other role playing games or whatever forever. Uh, even, you know, way back in the, towards the beginning, like first edition AD and D, you know, hit points can represent more than just your physical endurance. You know, it can, represent your stamina or your ability to like dodge at the last minute or you know whatever so uh you know a hit point doesn't necessarily have to be just straight wounds or damage um you know it, it can in and, and that you know however you want to kind of think of it especially in a uh, you know i mean if you're you're like like in, a, in real life and D and D's not real life don't get me wrong it's fantasy it's for fun it's a game but you know if somebody runs you through with a sword that's Probably basically it, but in D&D, &D, you know, you can get stabbed and hacked and fireballed and this and that, and you're still hanging in there. And as long as you got one hit point, you're fully, you know, then you get down to zero hit points and boom, you're down. So, you know, I guess, you know, uh, and this is kind of a side thought, you know, me running down a rabbit hole there, talking about the short rest versus long rest that, you know, hit points, again, don't have to be uh, straight damage. You know, they, they can represent other things. Um you know, and, and, and I guess each group or DM or whatever can kind of think about how they how they want that to be. But most people just kind of default to that's just physical damage. You know, you're just getting beat on and beat on and beat on and finally you kill over. So, um, but as I think, I think it was first edition ad and I think it, it was one of the earlier editions. I think even Gary, Gary Gygax was like, it doesn't make sense for, you know, whatever level fighter to have more hit points than a war horse, you know, <laughs> so uh little bit of imagination, a little bit of willing suspension of disbelief, which is a, a, a willing suspension of disbelief is a key psychological concept for any type of fiction, whether it's a game or a movie or a book or, you know, you willingly suspend your disbelief so that you can have fun. So anyway, all right, uh, enough of that. Um, a readied action. And this another is another kind of obvious no brainer, but we we wanted to clarify it last sec, last uh, session. A readied action lasts until the beginning of the character's next turn. So there you go. So if they say I'm going to ready 
an action, and if this happens, my character will do this. That lasts until the beginning of their next turn. Not it doesn't go away at the end of the um, at the round, the combat round. It it lasts until the beginning of their next turn. So there you go. Um, and uh, what if okay, dim light versus bright light. So uh, shadow demons. Uh, which came up in this last session because we did the adamantine tower encounter in the labyrinth. Shadow demons, uh, if they're under bright light, come under negative con. I think they get like disadvantage to certain roles if they're under bright light. And I was like, well, how do you know if it's bright light or not? And sure enough, I went and read and, you know, like spells, um, there's dim light versus bright light. And the examples I looked at, you know, I went and looked in the, uh, like, uh, Dancing Lights, the spell specifically says it's uh, dim light. So there you go, no confusion. Uh, the Sunblade puts out, within a certain distance, bright light. Uh, you know, so, so a Sunblade is a very effective weapon against um, a Shadow Demon. So just wanted to point out, and I never really paid attention or thought about it in 5th edition, up till now, maybe I've noticed it in other editions or whatever, but the like the the bright versus dim light is a is a game term. It's a game mechanic. And again, you know, I was pleased to see that the the exam. I was like, well, let me check a couple of examples, and I, I pulled up a couple of spells and and you know looked at the sunblade and some other stuff, and it it would specifically say puts out dim light or puts out bright light. So it's obvious that the designers, you know, want that to, to be an important, in certain circumstances, you know, thing. The, 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 the density or the quality of the light um, is important. So sometimes you have to pay attention to that. So just wanted to point that out. Um, now, last session, uh, you know, they had gotten into the labyrinth. They had uh, fought, uh, you know, I just kind of had a fun encounter for for the fun of it, they had fought a, a bunch of minotaurs and they fought uh, some gnolls. And then they had, um, and I had just done that just to, just to have a big fight. Uh, and, and then we were kind of getting more into the labyrinth proper. Um, and so, the again, as a reminder, that, that big fight with the minotaurs, which proved pretty tough, even though they're relatively low CR, if you use a lot of minotaurs, mini, mi, minotaur, like that. I don't know if you watched that video at the end of uh, that little video clip at the end of uh, the last video, but I think it was from like role models some where there's this, they're like society for creative anachronism kind of event. And this big truck comes in like a big bull and the guy's like, minotaur. And it, it was funny. Anyway, I'm on another tangent. So, um, Anyway, that I just want to remind you that that fight from last video was just something I threw together. It wasn't one of the random encounters or, or anything like that. Um, but anyway, so I, 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 had, I had mentioned last video that the players had found a clever use of the uh, limited, uh, or was it the wand of limited uh, vengeancy underdark teleportation which is just that narrative device i came up with for viseron uh gave them this device that through a ritual uh it, it lets them do some very teleportation under limited circumstances in the underdark um and i said they had done something clever but i, I couldn't remember exactly what it was they had done and, and so i was like hey well, what did you guys do last session and they and they sent me through it so here's what they did now, remember that the uh, the wand of limited, comma, vengeancy underdark teleportation, which is sort of the tongue-in-cheek name that we've given it, A is, a, again, it's just a narrative device, something I came up with. You're welcome to use it in your own. I, people are like, hey, can I use certain, certain elements? For, I'm like, that's why I do these videos. So, uh, you know, you're welcome to use any of this stuff that, that I throw out there um, if it helps you and you have fun with it. Um, so it, it will let you do teleportation in a you know a group of people but there are limits and i haven't defined exactly what those limits are i've said it's basically roughly the size of the expedition uh so they can kind of move the expedition around but you know you can't you can't teleport like a, a 500 person army or something like that you know it's it's it does have limitations and what it will let you do 
uh, it will let you teleport from where you're at back to the Tower of Vengeance, which which is where Viseron is, the the Drow Archmage that they've allied up with uh, to to fight the the Demon Lords. And if you teleport from the Tower of Vengeance, you o can only teleport back to the last place you teleported to the Tower of Vengeance from. And that's it. Uh, and, you know, like one of the players the other day was asking, well, how many charges does it use? And, uh, you know, I, I tried to explain it's It's not a magic item in those terms. Like, it doesn't really have charges. Uh, it just, you know, it, it takes 10 minutes. You cast a ritual, and it will let you do that very specific um, teleportation. And, I you know, I often say, you know, Viseron hasn't said given you limits, but he does say only use it as absolutely necessary. So if they abuse it or, or something, or if I just think it would be fun to have it malfunction, I can do that. So uh, just, you know, keeping that option open uh, to, to be able uh, to do that if I need to. Uh, but anyway, so what they had done was, because they were like, how do we get our, our riding lizards, those big mounted lizards they use, uh, how do we get them back into the Underdark using the teleportation because the problem is, if they teleport as an expedition back to the Tower of Vengeance, the little tunnel that you take out of the Tower of Vengeance into the the main Underdark is too narrow for those lizards. Like, you you know, it's kind of medium-sized creatures kind of have to, you know, work their way through it. It's kind of twisty and turny. So, like, what do we do? And, and what they decided to do, and it was pretty clever... Uh, obvious in retrospect, but still clever. Uh, they they teleported back to the D Tower of Vengeance from Gontelgrim. Because it's a long journey by foot. Or a lizard or whatever. Um, so they, they teleported to the Tower of Vengeance, that cavern that it's in. Then they, you know, a few of them walked out through that little tunnel to get out in the main Underdark. And then they teleported back to the tower. And then from there, they got everybody together, including the lizards. Because you, when you teleport from the tower, you teleport back to the last place you teleported from. So they got the lizards out. Pretty smart. You know, but I did remind them. They were like, are there any limitations or charges? And I said, well, you know, all he said, all Viseron has said is don't over, you know, only use it as necessary. So was that necessary? Yeah, I guess. But again, you know, I reserve the right to have some fun with the, with that, um, tower or that wand of vengeancy um uh, what is it wand of limited vengeancy under dark teleportation if i want to so um while they were um you know also the viseron last uh session had been quite upset well, like where's my book because he had uh, there was a player whose character had asked if he could borrow one of Viseron's book because he was a, a, a wizard, may, you know, and he just wanted, hey, can, you got a cool book I can read to learn more stuff about magic? And so Viseron was like, uh, sure. And so he lent him a book that, you know, could very likely drive him mad. Uh, and so then that player, again, you know, uh, left the group uh, because he just couldn't, he couldn't make it consistently. So, you know, I, I kind of... Um, said, you know, can, can you make it? Because if you can't make it consistently, it, you know, probably gonna probably need to drop out. Uh, sorry for the noise there. Probably need to drop out because you know the, the the group's pretty big and there's a way. You know, people have asked to come in and I've said I had to turn them away. But anyway, we've already been through all that. So anyway, so that player left. So that character in game went back to the guild house uh, for another mission, taking the book. And Viseron's like, where is my book? Uh, so that was kind of an unexpected, fun role-playing thing. Now, um, they discussed, uh, it came up, the players were like, should we use the sending stones? You know, it's like sending stone technology or whatever uh, to, to send messages to Gontel Grimm or, and, and then hopefully from Gontel Grimm to the guild that, hey, you know, Viseron wants his book back, which I thought wasn't a bad idea, but, you know, they, they didn't really make a decision on that either way. Now, um, Having gone through all that, uh, really about all we did last session uh, was the adamant the adamantine uh, tower encounter. 
uh, and that's that straight there there's a few set encounters you can do in the labyrinth and one of them is on page 180 and it's the adamant adamantine I guess adamantine tower I guess that's how you say it uh, adamantine I would say adamantine and uh, adamantine is just a a very 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 durable hard uh, metal in D&D it's uh you know, if you think like uh, in um, Marvel Comics, they have adamantium, which is like this virtually indestructible metal. And adamantine is very similar to that in the D&D world. Um, although I would I would say that adamantine in D&D is, is very durable, but it could probably be damaged easier than adamantium. Because adamantium in Marvel Comics is, I mean, really, really hard to damage. Uh, so if you go to... Uh, Page 178 and one, or 179, uh, at the top, it talks about labyrinth encounters. Remember, we're in the labyrinth, chapter 14. Uh, and it said, this chapter features a number of set encounters. Uh, either as the characters journey to the labyrinth or return to Viseron's Tower, you can run the Adamine, Adamantine Tower encounter. <laughs> For whatever reason, I just thought it'd be fun to run it. There was no, you know, deep calculus and strategy. I was just like, well, this, this sounds fun to run. So I ran it for the characters. Even though I was like, ah, do I really want to give them like this really powerful magic item of this, you know, instant fortress? And I'm like, okay, you know, why not? Because um, I, I knew they'd probably figure it out and take it, you know, which they did. We'll get into here in a moment. Uh, and then once the characters reach the edge of the labyrinth, go to the Spiral of the Horned Lord encounter. So one thing I kind of messed up last session, the previous session, before this one, was I, I said, well, you basically, you come to the labyrinth. And I kind of started describing the labyrinth. And then they had that big fight. Uh, really, I, I should have had them do the, uh, the when, you, when you get to the edge of the labyrinth, then, uh, then you run the Spiral of the Horned Lord encounter, which is kind of, kind of the gate to the labyrinth in a way. So, no big deal. I mean, my players aren't going to know the difference. But just so you know, really, like, because I was already saying, you know, describing the general features of the labyrinth and how crazy the tunnels are and this and that and the other. And they really shouldn't have, have, have started finding that kind of terrain uh, and environment until they were in the labyrinth proper. Not a big deal. Just wanted to point that out um, to avoid possibly confusing you, my beloved viewer. So um, the other thing that it's important to know is that in the labyrinth, um, that throughout the entire labyrinth, uh, the fair's rest is an effect. So as long as you're in the labyrinth, uh, the effects of fair's rest are, are, are in effect. Uh, and so spellcasters, you know, have that possible like wild magic, um, you know, on, on spell casting and whatnot. So, you know, just b like brush up on your knowledge of, of what, what happens in the fair's rest when you're in the fair's rest, that magical energy that's throughout the underdark while, while you're in out of the abyss. Cause there's some additional effects to it, um, uh, because of the madness of the, of the demon Lords and whatnot. So, uh, there you go. And you know what? I'll let this, I've been washing myself out with computer monitor. Well, actually browser white, uh, for all that time. So, um, Remember that. Uh, also, characters in the labyrinth can easily become lost. Traveling through this area follows the rules under navigating in Chapter 2, but it takes a successful DC-12 wisdom parentheses survival check to avoid becoming lost rather than a DC-10. And remember, the fair's rest is throughout the labyrinth. So as soon as they're in the labyrinth, the, the fair's rest is just throughout the labyrinth. So for the spell casting and any other effects that the fair's rest brings to the table make sure to keep that in mind. So, cause you can really have fun with the fair's rest in out of the abyss and it's easy to forget about. So, um, so anyway, uh, within the labyrinth, you have, a uh, you will on the way to, or leaving the labyrinth, you can run Adamantine, Adamantine tower. When they first get to the labyrinth, uh, do spiral of the horned Lord. And then within the labyrinth, uh, there's some set encounters of the filth riddens March to nowhere Yanogu's Hunt and the Gallery of Angels, which is the main destination for being in the labyrinth anyways, the Gallery of Angels. 
And it's possible they may do the maze engine encounter, which, you know, is described um, in, later in the chapter. So, you know, I'm actually not sure because, as, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, you know, we've been in this campaign for quite some time. I may not do every encounter. I may, for example, I may not do, you know, you know, goose hunt. You know, goo, you know who, you, you know, you know who, I don't, maybe they're messing with me. I'm going to say Yinogu, Yinogu's Hunt. Uh, I may not do that one. Maybe I might not, maybe, I don't know if I'll do the March to Nowhere. Uh, I may not do the Filth Riddens. I'll probably do the Filth Riddens. Uh, I probably will not do the March to Nowhere because the March to Nowhere involves Modrons and helps point the characters to the Maze Engine. Well, it just so happens that this party, my, my, my group, they have a Modron uh, that they got from um, the Beholder's Lair. Uh, the, you know, they, they kept the Modron and, and, and it's kind of bonded with one of the characters. Um, but I'll probably do Filth Riddens and I'll probably do, uh, well, I'll definitely do Gallery of Angels. And I think it'd be fun if they do the name, if they do the Maze Engine, I'm not going to push them towards it because it can get kind of crazy, almost like a deck of many things. Not that quite bad, but, but pretty crazy, pretty random, crazy stuff. Uh, and you know, and we'll cover those as as the videos progress and the ones that I definitely don't cover, you know, I'll, I'll try to at least give a brief overview of, but you know, read the chapter and, and kind of study up on them. And then, um, there's random encounters, which again, I probably won't do for brevity's sake. Uh, twice each day that the party spins in the labyrinth, uh, roll a, roll a D 20 and consult the labyrinth encounters table. And there's, there's several encounters. Now the one, uh, the one, Random encounter that's worth knowing about is uh, the Knoll Pack random encounter. The first time that they have that, they can get a, uh, a they potentially can uh, get a uh, a guide in the labyrinth, a a Knoll named Kerr, K U R R. So it's it's uh, it's important to know about that one. And then they say, you know, if you roll that random encounter again, you know, Kerr's not there, but that first time he's there. And it's it's possible uh, to to get him as a guide in the in the in the labyrinth. So it's important to know that. Now, uh, the adamantine tower. Uh, basically, what it is, and I'll I'll read the uh, the description here. It says vaulted vaulted chambers bristle with stalactites and stalagmites, showing you showing your passage as you wind your way across uneven floors. Moving through a narrow passage, you enter a cavern dimly lit by phosphorescent fungi. And are met by the start of a dark metal tower perched on the edge of a cliff that drops away into darkness. The square tower is 20 feet on a side and 30 feet high, with arrow slits in each wall. A battlement crowns its top, with stone gargoyle with a stone gargoyle peering over each side. So there's four stone gargoyles up there. Set in the middle of the wall facing you is a sturdy-looking door made of the same dark metal as the rest of the tower. So uh, this is essentially. Uh, well, it's not essentially it is. It's a Darren's Instant Fortress, which uh, is described in full uh, in the Magic section uh, or Treasure section of the Dungeon Master's Guide uh, in Chapter 7. So let's grab that. Let's see here. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see if I still have that. Yes, page... Uh, 160 and 161, Darren's Instant Fortress. Now, um, you know, you can go look it up for yourself, uh, but it, essentially it's a little one inch metal cube that if you speak its command word, it will, um, it will boom rapidly grow into this, this 20 foot by 30 foot fortress. Um, and then you can use an action and speak the command word that dismisses it, which will bring it back to the little cube. But it will not reduce, even if you speak the command word, um, if it's unless it's empty. And best I can tell by reading, um, you know, the description, that means empty. It doesn't mean like there's nobody. It means empty. So if there's anything in there that's not part of the original magic item, it won't shrink. So somebody could literally toss in an old shoe and it, and it won't. It won't, you know, reset down to its little one-inch metal cube. That's how I'm reading it. You know, perhaps 
somebody knows different and it, and it can uh, it's very tough um, and it can take it could take um, it's well hold on a second what is the uh, do do let's see the tower is made of adamantine and its magic prevents it from being tipped over so that's one that you literally can't tip it over um, the roof the door and the walls each have a hundred hit points immunity to damage from non-magical weapons excluding siege weapons and resistance to all over damage. Only a wish spell can re repair the fortress. This use of the spell counts as replicating a spell of eighth. Counts as replicating a spell of eighth level or lower. Each casting of wish causes the roof, the door, one wall to regain fifty hit points. So, uh, and and another there is there's kind of a trap door uh, to the uh, to the roof, and there's also a front door that you have to know the. Um, the command words uh, to open. Um, it's immune to the knock spell and similar magic, uh, so you can't use a chime of opening or knock or anything like that on it. So it, it's pretty handy. Um, it's almost almost artifact level, not quite, but I mean it's pretty darn handy. And then it um, it um, if you use one thing that they mention in the book, Out of the Abyss. If you use identify, if you cast identify, then it will reveal like the nature of what this thing is, plus its command words. So that that's important to know. Um, and, and one other thing that's that's really handy about this thing, you can kind of use it like a little like a fireball almost. Um, each each creature in the area where the fortress appears must make a DC 15 dexterity saving throw or take 10 d10 bludgeoning damage. Uh, on a failed save or half as much damage on a successful one. So it's almost like a little reusable fireball. There's a whole bunch of people. You toss the little cube in the middle of them and you give the command word, boom, and it, and it can do all this damage. So, of course, the players are like, ah, you know, once they figured out what's going on, they're like, we must have this thing, um, you know, because they're thinking reusable fireball, right? Players will be players. So, you know, you might want to read up a little bit more on Darren's Instant Fortress. But that's basically, you know, what it is. Uh, and when, in Out of the Abyss, when they encounter this one, it's it's setting like kind of on the edge of a cliff, but it won't tip over because, again, due to the magic of it, it's impossible to tip over. So, uh, Detect Magic will reveal, you know, what it is. Uh, and an Identify spell will uh, give you the, the command words and whatnot. So... Uh, you know, keep that in mind. This can be a fun encounter. Basically, what happened is the owner, uh, I guess, cast it, ran inside, uh, and a couple of shadow demons followed the owner in. And after, you know, the owner closed himself up in or herself, I, I don't know if it, um, how how much, um, in, you know, how much detail it went in on who the owner was. But anyway, the shadow demons killed them. And then the shadow demons were hanging out in there. And then you got these gargoyles up top. Now the gargoyles are just kind of there. They're not part of the magic item. Uh, but I guess the Underdark being the Underdark, some gargoyles decided to hang out on top of this thing. So you can have a pretty good uh, fight here. Um, there's four gargoyles on top of the tower. And then there's the two shadow demons. And, you know, under the right circumstances, the shadow demons can be dangerous. Um, you know, so make sure to study up on... Um, on the shadow demons and the gargoyles and just kind of read through this, uh, you know, before you run the encounter and it's a fun little encounter. Uh, let's see if I have any uh, other notes on how I ran it. Uh, yeah. I, one thing I did do, I just had the shadow demons automatically get surprised on the first character that, because they go up to the second floor, there's like a little ladder that goes up to the second floor and, and, and that's where the shadow demons are. And I just, for, to make it an interesting encounter because I knew that the, as said, I didn't add any extra shadow demons or gargoyles or anything. I knew that the characters would handle themselves pretty well, the party. Um, so I just automatically gave the shadow demons surprise uh, on the first character that went to the second floor because they didn't take any cautious approach. I mean, they just, they just said, whoop, up we go. Um, and, you know, they like they specifically said, I'm going to the second floor. And they didn't say, I'm looking or stealthing or whatever. So I just gave the shadow demons um, surprise. That's about really the only thing I did. I already talked about the dim light versus bright light. 
bright light will have a negative effect on shadow demons. So make sure to study up on the shadow demons. I think it gives them like disadvantage. Uh, let's see what the what the bright light does. Gives them disadvantage, I believe, on uh, on maybe attack rolls. Well, let's see, shadow demons. Uh, well, it was in here. Light sensitivity. While in bright light, the demon has disadvantage on attack rolls as well as on wisdom perception checks that rely on sight. On uh, sight. Um, and if they're in dim light or darkness, they can take the hide action as a bonus action. And they also have incorporeal movement, so they can move through uh, creatures and objects as if they were difficult terrain. Um, you know, so just study up. Uh, you know, it was a fun fight. I, I didn't really expect it to be a super challenging fight. It was more interesting to me to watch the characters kind of come upon this little tower and like, what is going on here? And try to puzzle it out. And, you know, one I have to give one of my players uh, props that, you know, it was, it was pretty early in that out of character they realized this is a Darren's instant fortress. Uh, but they played it, they they played that in character very well. Like, you know, like, they're like, I know what this is, but they, you know, they still played it pretty well um, and were able to kind of still participate and kind of guide the role play without completely abusing that knowledge. And, and you know, I, I was pretty impressed with that. But, yeah, they ended up uh, using detect magic. And, I mean, this thing is just boom magic. They cast Identify as a ritual because they had plenty of time. Um, so they cast Identify and they figured you know, it was a Darren's Instant Fortress and they got the command words and all that stuff and went in and, and fought. And then after that, uh, they went into um, the... Uh, uh, they, they, they came to the uh, Spiral of the Horned King encounter, which we'll go into more detail uh, next video because basically... Uh, the Spiral of the Horn King, it says the tunnel you have been following gradually widens until it opens into a cave with a high ceiling overhead. Patches of glowing fungi cling to the walls and fill the chamber with dim light. It says columns of stone support the ceiling, the rock marbled with veins of glittering crystal. Across the chamber, a great cleft is ringed by a profusion of sigils and glyphs. Stacked to either side of the opening are two mounds of severed heads. And, and you know, that's pretty much where I left it. There is another encounter here that can happen pretty quickly with a knoll named Gash that can also turn out to be a guide under the right circumstances into the labyrinth. But we'll get into that next video. That's where, uh, you know, our party ended right there. So um, I think that's, yeah, we ended right there even before uh, the knoll appears. And that is, that's pretty much what happened last time. So one thing I did want to do, uh, I meant to do, I'm going to put my plus three, uh, spectacles of viewer feedback on uh, and let, I wanted to look real quick at the uh, surprise rolls I meant to already have those pulled up so let's see here um, dun, dun, five ear surprise rules what do you bet that it's gonna take me to roll 20 that's usually the first place I end up when I search roll 20 there it is right there let's take a look uh, combat. So the surprise, I just, I don't know if I've gone over this in, in, in these videos before I think I have, but it's, it's probably been a while. So here's how surprise works. If you get surprise, uh, in D and D five E, um, if you're surprised, you can't move or take an action on your first turn of the combat. And you can't take a reaction until that turn ends. Um, and a member of the group can be surprised even if the other members aren't. So that's basically the effects of surprise. Um, as far as determining surprise, uh, the GM determines... So here, here's the example that's given. A band of adventurers sneaks up on a bandit camp, springing from the trees to attack them, or a gelatinous cube glides down a dungeon passage, unnoticed by the adventurers until the cube engulfs one of them. In these situations, one side of the battle gains surprise over the other. The GM determines who might be surprised. 
or the DM. I don't know why it says GM. I mean, these are specifically D&D rules. Anyway, uh, the DM determines who might be surprised. If neither side tries to be stealthy, they automatically notice each other. Otherwise, the GM, GM DM, this is D&D rules. I don't know why they're saying DM. This is on roll 20. Uh, the DM compares the dexterity, parentheses, stealth checks of anyone hiding with the passive wisdom, parentheses, perception score of each creature on the opposing side. Any character or monster that doesn't notice a threat is surprised at the start of the counter. So there you go. Basically, does your stealth beat, um, if you're trying to be stealthy, does your stealth beat the uh, the passive perception score of each creature on the opposing side? And I guess there may be situations where... Uh, well, you know, if they're if they're using active perception, not passive perception, it's probably going to be hard to surprise because they, you know, they're looking for something. So, but there might still be situations where you rule that somebody who's actively looking could still be surprised. And again, if you're surprised, you can't move or take an action on your first turn of the combat, and you can't take a reaction until that turn ends. A member of a group can be surprised, even if the other members aren't. So there you go. That's the five E surprise rules, uh, as written anyway. So, uh, thanks so much for watching this uh, edition of the Shane Plays uh, note series of Out of the Abyss. And we will catch you next time as we do the Spiral of the Horn King encounter and continue to go deeper into the labyrinth on the way to the Gallery of Angels. Uh, thanks so much for watching. If you would, uh, leave, a, leave a, a comment on the video, uh, maybe a thumbs up. That helps me tremendously. And we will catch you next time on Shane Plays. Plenty of. What have you got?